and welcome back. I hope everyone has their coffee spilled and that we're ready for another mor morning of the Micro-Credential Forum. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The offices of eCampus Ontario, located in downtown Toronto, are within the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We encourage you to take a moment to consider the land on which you have the honor and privilege of living, working, and learning. We invite you to use the chat window to acknowledge the tra traditional territories from which you join us this morning. Thank you. Day two of the Micro-Credential Forum will bring us even more examples of micro-credentials in practice. Today, we are lucky enough to see local examples in action from Humber College, Ontario Tech University, and Six Nations Polytechnic. From HECO, we will hear about recent research in micro-credentials. We'll also hear how the University of Maine system is leading an effort to build a statewide micro-credential ecosystem with rural and marginalized learners at the center. And first up this morning, we'll travel to Dublin with our keynote speaker, Mark Brown, who asks whether 2022 is the international year of the micro-credential. But before we get to all of that, I will first welcome back to the stage, CEO of eCampus Ontario, Dr. Robert Luke. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Emma, and thank you. Uh, thanks for running a great day yesterday. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly learned a lot, uh, and it was really, um, it was really great to see uh, the community engagement and involvement. It's my pleasure today to introduce um, our Deputy Minister, Shelley Tapp, uh, to give opening remarks. Um, Deputy Tapp became um, Deputy Minister of Colleges and Universities in August of 2020. And previously, she served as Deputy Minister of Transportation. She's also held roles uh, of Assistant Deputy Minister of the Corporate Services Division and Chief Administrative Officer for the Ministry of Transportation and Ministry of Infrastructure. Uh, Deputy Tapp has held a number of senior management positions, leading organizational development, business and strategic planning, research and innovation, and division corporate management services. She brings strong leadership, relationship management, and oversight experience, having led a number of reviews for the Ministry of Transportation. In addition, Deputy Tapp has strong operational and policy skills as a result of leading large, complex organizations. I, I can only imagine how large and complex uh, MCU is. Uh, I know we only see the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Shelley has also worked with the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs of Ontario, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the former Municipality of Metropolitan Toronto, the City of Toronto, and the City of St. Catharines. She is a graduate of the University of Waterloo and holds a degree in environmental studies and planning. She is also a graduate of Queen's University's executive program and the OPS leadership development program. And I didn't actually realize this until today that we were both Queen's graduates, uh, Deputy. So I have the great fortune of working with Deputy Tapp and many members of her team to support numerous initiatives that benefit our sector. Uh, this includes Assistant Deputy Minister Tamara Gilbert and her team at the Digital Learning Policy Branch, including Anna Boyden and Julie Greenspoon, Assistant Deputy Minister Rachel Simeon and her team at the Research Data and Innovation Group, Yasser Mutaki, Samantha Chongson, Kevin Delamarta, and Zoe Nostas Tates, as well as Patty Buckley on the micro credentials file, which of course is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, Deputy, you lead a committed group of professionals who are dedicated to ensuring that Ontario's teaching, learning, and research are first in class, and it's my pleasure to support this work. Deputy Tapp, over to you. Thanks, Robert. Yes, I have a fantastic team at MCU and uh, an incredibly bunch of hardworking and committed uh, folks, so very, uh, very blessed to be with this ministry and happy to be here today. So thank you for that uh, introduction. And um, I'm really excited to join you for day two of, of, of the Micro-Credentials Forum. And I know Minister Dunlop uh, was here yesterday and uh, to kick you off and went into detail on the government's plan for micro-credentials. From investing in the development of new industry-driven micro-credentials to being the first jurisdiction in Canada to fund micro-credentials through a student financial assistance program and launching a new portal to make it easier for people to explore rapid training opportunities. A lot of truly great progress has been made since the government launched the Ontario Micro-Credential Strategies in 2020. 
The strategy sets a foundation for lifelong learning by normalizing micro-credentials as a permanent feature of our post-secondary education and training system. And for those of you that have been following the government's progress, you'll know that the future strategy work also includes a virtual skills passport that will enable students to securely track, store, and share their micro-credentials. Our ministry looks forward to keeping you informed as work continues on that initiative and other components of our plan. But beyond our micro-credential strategy, I want to touch on the fact that these rapid training programs don't just exist in isolation. They are, much, they are part of a much larger thoughtful plan that is shaping the province's post-secondary land, landscape. For example, Ontario has undergone an unprecedented shift in the response to COVID-19 that has seen virtual learning emerge as an essential component of post-secondary education. It's not a nice to have anymore, but truly essential. As we look to the future, I see a return to what we were used to in pre-pandemic times. I think it's important to take stock of where we started at the beginning of the pandemic and carefully consider what we should and need to prioritize going forward. And for me, so much of the post-secondary learning relates to access. That's the, why I'm so proud of the government's $70 million investment towards Ontario's first ever virtual learning strategy. We have set up the post-secondary sector for success through a plan that aims to improve access and drive innovation in virtual teaching and learning because we want to give every Ontarian the opportunity to have access to education throughout the course of their life. In today's world, learning is lifelong and it's critical that government is responsive to that fact. The virtual learning strategy was shaped by consultations with the post-secondary sector and emphasizes the importance of accessible and sustainable growth in virtual learning. It also helps Ontario's efforts to grow our digital footprint and builds the skilled workforce needed to support our economy. Our strategy directly supports micro-credentials as many of them are offered online or have an online component. Virtual learning can improve access to micro-credentials in both French and English through any time, anywhere learning, providing all Ontarians a fair chance to compete in the labor market. Through the development of stackable, trackable tra credits, and micro-credentials, Ontario's post-secondary education sector is positioning itself to deliver much-needed education and training to new and expanded markets of lifelong learners that have not been pre previously accessible. It is certainly an exciting time for post-secondary education in Ontario. As awareness of micro-credentials and the quality and quantity of growing offerings continue to grow, Ontario learners will have a maximum flexibility to pursue learning opportunities and acquire the skills needed to be job ready at any stage of their career. I'm very pleased to see schools like Humber, Ontario Tech, and Six Nations Polytechnic here today to share their experiences with developing micro-credentials. And as always, I thank eCampus Ontario for being an, an incredible leader in this space and an incredible partner. I look forward to hearing from others today on how micro-credentials are being taught in practice and their thoughts on how they see this emerging learning option fitting into the broader post-secondary landscape. So thank you so much for having me this morning to kick off your morning and thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your event. Thank you so much, Deputy Tapp. Thank you for your support. Now to introduce the first session of the day, I will introduce you to my brilliant colleague, Sandra Janicek. Thanks, Emma, and hello, everyone. My name is Sandra, and I'm a Program and Service Coordinator here at eCampus Ontario, where I support the micro-credential file. I'll be moderating today's keynote session, and before we begin, I want to bring your attention to the Engage tab located above my head in the FeedLoop platform. During this presentation, we will be using Slido to facilitate polling. So when you are prompted, please click on the Engage tab to navigate to the poll question, and once completed, you may return to this screen by simply clicking the video tab. If you have any questions or experience technical difficulties doing so, please use the chat. Our team is here to assist. Speaking of the chat box, we also invite you to comment and ask questions throughout the presentation as we have allocated time at the end of this session to answer your questions. Without further ado, I am honored and excited to introduce our keynote speaker from across the Atlantic, Dr. Mark Brown, Ireland's first chair of digital learning and director of the National Institute for Digital Learning at Dublin City University. Mark is an Eden Fellow and serves on the management board of Eden Digital Learning Europe. 
He also serves on the supervisory board of the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. Originally from New Zealand, Mark continues to maintain strong links down under and is vice president of the Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia. Mark, it is a pleasure to have you joining us today to share your global perspective and to address making micro-credentials. Are we mixing oil and water? Over to you, Mark. Mark, you're muted. You're still muted. Let's try again, folks. It seems to be uh, one of the, the words of the last two years, you're on mute. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I would just like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of the lands that we're on today, uh, where we're meeting virtually. I'd like to take a, a moment just to acknowledge the importance of the lands that we each call home. As you heard in my introduction, my original home is New Zealand, so I have a strong affinity to the Indigenous peoples. Um, and I'd like to reaffirm that commitment down our responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. So I'm asking today in making micro-credentials, are we mixing oil and water? In some respects, I feel like I'm a fraud here in this um, keynote presentation because the focus of your forum is a practitioner's toolbox, but my work is largely academic. Um, I like to think of myself as a professional, as a scholarly professional, not a professional scholar, but I think some of you who have already talked yesterday and are going to share your experiences today have a lot more to share than I have at a toolbox practitioner level. On the other hand, I take no real, um, or make no excuses for asking some critical questions today, because I do think that we have to seriously consider whether in fact we are trying to mix oil and water here. And in the work that I've certainly been engaged in in micro-credentials, it's very dirty work. Your hands do get dirty. So I'm sort of anchoring this talk in that metaphor. And we'll see if the metaphor works. Metaphors don't always um, stack up. But I thought before I go any further, let's give you an opportunity to answer the question as to whether you think mixing oil and water is what micro-credentials is about or not. Um, so from your experience, I've got a poll here just to set the scene. Are we trying to mix oil and water in our efforts to rapidly infuse micro-credentials into the Canadian post-secondary education context? So you heard the instructions of how you go off to um, complete that poll in Slido. What I'm going to do is probably just keep talking for a little bit and then we'll come back in with the results so we don't just stop here and have a moment entirely of pause. So go off and I invite you to complete the poll. If you've got an other, please explain. Why don't you put that in the chat box um, so you've actually elaborated on what you think the other response might be. So while you're doing that, uh, assuming you're able to multitask, um, a little link to a very critical piece I wrote only just before the holiday break at Christmas period. Um, and I guess the link to oil and water here is that sheepskin has a natural kind of oil in it. But if you want to have a look at this, I'm going to share the link later, um, asking again in a similar way as to whether micro-credentials are nothing more than a wolf in sheep's clothing, that there are risks here. So that's a kind of the critical flavor that I'm wanting to capture. And then as you heard in my introduction, I think right at the start, is this year really the year of the micro-credential? It's only a decade ago where we were celebrating, or some of us maybe have not been entirely celebrating, we were at least acknowledging the year of the MOOC. And there are some very strong parallels in the hype and the hope around what micro-credentials might do for us. Maybe it's more about what we can do with micro-credentials. As you're finishing off your poll result or your own poll and seeing what the results come through, I'm going to ask um, 
Sandra, I think, to come in shortly and give us an update. I'll just give you a sense of what we're going to do in the time available, extending the metaphor. So I think first thing is, if you're going to have a practitioner's toolbox, you've got to make sure you've got the right tool. So I'm going to talk about some of the right tools that you need. And then where do you find the good oil? Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about different models, different approaches to implementing micro-credentials successfully or not. And then lastly, really drilling down into being honest about the state of the actual instead of the state of the art. Where are some of the gaps and leaks that we need to focus on? So that's the general roadmap, if you like. Um, throughout the talk, I'm going to anchor a lot of what I'm sharing in a very substantial state-of-the-art literature review that I led with a team last year commissioned for the European Commission and the work that was going on. So we had 10 research questions, which is a lot of research questions. Every question you ask as a researcher, you have to find an answer for. And then these them thematic foci around why, what, who, how, and where. And those, I think, are all questions that are relevant to this forum, probably from yesterday's discussions as well as today. Seems like a little bit of blatant self-promotion here. It's not intended to be. In the major literature review, um, following sort of the standard processes where you have inclusion and exclusion criteria, and you look at the various databases of published literature, what we ended up finding was that 87% of the literature we identified, or some of which I'm going to share shortly, was already available in this resource that our unit maintains called the Micro-Credential Observatory. So if you haven't um, seen that before, I'll try and put a link in the chat box at some stage, or someone may wish to do that. So um, last comment, I guess, before we just ask uh, Sandra to come in with giving us an overview of the poll result is uh, in terms of the methodology, what was quite important because our funder, the European Commission, wanted to look at in particular literature that was relevant to the European context, what you'll see in some of the tables that I share will be a, the sample at large and then a European specific sample, not necessarily European only literature, but literature that might inform the European context. And in following a process where we firstly described the literature, then we interpreted it and then critically analyzed the literature, every single publication we identified was reviewed by three different people. So a reasonably robust methodology. So I'm gonna stop now and just see what your thoughts are in that poll result and to have a change of voice, give me a chance to just take a pause. Sandra, do you wanna give us a quick overview? Sure. So. Only 4% said, yes, they simply don't mix. 32% no, they can be successfully added to the mix. 51%, the majority said, depends on whether we're willing to get our hands dirty. 11% said too early to say, we need to wait and see where they settle. And 2% said other. Okay, well, that's, that's interesting. And it's good for me to have a sense of the landscape, shall we say. Um, of where people are coming from. So let's push on. The right tools. So one thing I think you can pat your backs on in Ontario and Canada in particular. Now I need to emphasize, I said that I'm an academic, I'm not a practitioner necessarily. So what I'm sharing with you is the literature, the published literature, not so much the gray literature, not all those blog posts and short pieces that you read. This is the published literature, and maybe the published literature doesn't match what's happening on the ground. But what I can say is that in 2020 and 2021 of the published literature, over 50% of that literature had been produced in those two years. Uh, we began in 2015 in the review. That was a bit of a watershed year and so, some seminal publications. So half the literature published in the last two years Secondly, Canada last year had 50% of that literature and a fairly high proportion out of Ontario. So uh, in one sense, it's a pat on the back of the work that's going on, clearly the level of activity. Um, on the other hand, you know, let's be a little critical, is that um, all focused in the right direction and for the right purpose? I'll hear hopefully from you on that front. 
But we also know from the literature review. So again, perhaps the literature doesn't really reflect what's happening on the ground. 85% of the main sample of literature was focused on higher education institutions or in your context, post-secondary institutions. Very limited literature actually from the MOOC sector, um, only around 10%, even though we know the MOOC sector is pretty um, engaged in micro-credentials. The vocational uh, further education sector, the training sector, not particularly obvious at all in the literature. So less than 30%. And you can probably read and see how employers certainly don't show up particularly much in the literature at all. In fact, my next slide is just to do a bit of self-promotion, but also to anchor this in the Irish context, we conducted a national survey of employers. And I'm sure this comes as no surprise to you. Half the employers didn't know what we meant by the term micro-credential. Um, this is 2020. I'm not sure a lot has changed. Um, the report was published in 2021. So um, that just gives you a sense of the literature may be not fully matching, as I say, the reality on the ground. Another aspect to uh, this analysis of the literature is we really have to make a very important distinction between older forms of micro-credentials, if we're going to use that language, and newer forms of micro-credentials. An Australian study published last year uh, from data in 2019 showed that on an annual basis, um, about 2.6 million people participate in small training bundles that just quantify that Australia, a country of roughly 25 million. So we're, we're talking about 10% of the workforce uh, or 10% of the population, much higher percentage of the workforce um, engaging in these training bundles, hiding um, in plain sight. In fact, if I drill down a little bit, and whilst the context is different, I think there are some lessons here. So in the Australian context, this survey asked employers, what would they be engaging in most likely in terms of continuing professional development for their employees? Very few said micro-credentials. Maybe that's because the term micro-credential doesn't mean a lot. Many of them, the vast majority said short courses, but then when we look at where those short courses are coming from, universities are by far the smallest group or sex subsector offering short courses. Historically, it just hasn't been part of what universities have done. Um, TAFEs are like uh, in colleges, of colleges or institutes of technology um, and so forth. The other observation from the study is the vast majority of these short courses were being provided in the private sector with no government funding or contribution. So if we put this into the Canadian context, hopefully I'm, I'm not bringing coals to Newcastle if that expression makes sense to you, because this comes right from your own doorstep, where arguably one of the best examples of the oldest form of micro-credential from the St. John's Ambulance, half a million Canadians a year, complete a St. John's certificate, first began in eight. 1833, and based on data from 2019, 10,000 jobs in Toronto were advertised requiring a St. John's certificate. Um, so a highly credible micro-credential with great currency, if you like. So that's the older form of micro-credential. In Ireland, we have exactly the same scenario where our quality agency, our National Quality Assurance Agency, produced a survey last year or an analysis of micro-credentials. And the vast majority, by far, all come from private colleges and private training organizations, these older forms of micro-credentials, not universities. The only difference is, and perhaps this might be the bit that you're still working on in Ontario, is micro-credentials can fit within our national qualification framework and that's what you're actually seeing here. So we can offer within our national qualification framework already credit-bearing micro-credentials. It's actually quite unique in, um, in Europe and if you're familiar with the literature in this area, New Zealand is actually the first country in the world that built micro-credentials into its national qualification framework. 
in the European context, um, I was involved in an approach to develop a whole of European approach to micro-credentials. And this is really quite unique to have um, countries all working towards a common definition. This is the working definition. There's even a report this week that has come out that takes this even further. Some key words, I'm not gonna get caught up in micro-credential wars around definitions here, but the key words around proof and, and, and assessment and standards, quality assurance, if you like. Um, but what I, the reason for introducing that to you is to get you to think about in your toolbox, how you're positioning micro-credentials. I heard from the minister uh, there around how they are being seen as really central to lifelong learning and employability and access. What we found in the literature that I've referred to previously when we analyzed the positioning of micro-credentials, the vast majority of the published literature actually sees them as alternative or supplementary. You can see only around about 23% saw them as something embedded into the mainstream. Actually, even less, because there's a lot of hope about micro-credentials as a new form of rethinking post-secondary education, a reimagined partnership model that's not reflected in the published literature at all. Um, so I'm gonna share a bit more of that shortly, but what I'm really wanting you to think about in your own toolbox is to whether you're looking to embed micro-credentials? Is your institution just simply seeing them as an alternative to what you already have as supplementary? Or is it really a key bridging path for a different kind of pathway for lifelong learning? So rather than me leave that question unanswered, I would like to stop at this point just for a moment and give you the chance to complete a second poll. So here's the question. You know how to do this now. Um, click on your tab. And um, as you're doing that, I will just sort of give you a sense of the options here. I'm asking you to, uh, to think about your institution or your organization or whichever term best fits your own local circumstance, not necessarily your personal view here. So is it alternative or is it embedded? Or are you even up for disruption and reimagination in your organization? Again, what I'm going to do is just ask um, Sandra to come back in shortly um, to share the results, to give me a moment to stop talking and you hear a different voice. So I'll just keep going into part two um, as you're completing the poll. Where do we find the good oil? Well, first and foremost, I think even your, the minister talked about that the COVID crisis has amplified and accelerated interest in micro-credentials. That certainly seems to be the case in, in many countries around the world. Of course, we also hear about the schools crisis, um, the changing nature of work. Um, the World Economic Forum estimates 50% of people will need to be reskilled by 2025. We do need to be slightly critical of some of these figures because it has been a statement for some time that 65% of jobs won't exist in the future, those sorts of throwaway lines that have been shown not to have solid empirical basis to them. But I don't think there would be many people that could argue work is changing, the nature of work. And of course, we also heard, I'm pleased to hear about how access and lifelong learning feature in what you're doing in Ontario. Here's data from Europe, where actually the rates of lifelong learning are very low, really, um, you know, embarrassingly low, where in Ireland we have around about 12.5% of the population engaged in lifelong learning. We could question the definition that's adopted here, but this survey that's done is reliable in that it's a difference between reliability and validity, because it's repeated every year across Europe. To put that into your own context, I don't have figures broken down. Um, you no doubt have these for Ontario, but Canada is slightly above Ireland on the OECD league table, um, only slightly, so not exactly something to celebrate, although I should probably um, use New Zealand here and, and Norway and Denmark, the Scandinavian countries. Maybe that's where we need to be looking for the good oil because they have very high rates of participation in, in lifelong learning. So those are one of the drivers, employability, lifelong learning. What did we find in the literature? 
not surprisingly, they figured very highly. You can see, though, when we analyze the literature, we also put quite a number of other things that we were looking for. And I want to drill down a little deeper. Um, again, those who may have come in a little late, the two columns you're seeing here is all the publications and the highly relevant ones are the ones we ended up selecting more specific to your European interest. But look at the bottom. Micro-credentials as a driver, if you like, and an attractor, a push and a pull for micro-credentials to increase equity for underrepresented groups. Not really. Um, here's another way of seeing the same data um, where I've presented it in a spider diagram, a radar diagram. So equity does not figure and promotion of the sustainable development goals does not figure in the literature at all, really. Um, so perhaps we have to think a little bit more carefully about the reasons we're investing in micro-credentials. Some would say, actually, if we're really just crude about this, it's the economy, stupid. We need it, show us the money. And there's no doubt that um, the online education market is accelerating rapidly post-COVID. And so maybe that's the driver for your institution to increase new revenue streams. Well, it, talk of money, I guess, introduces the idea of business models. Not everyone um, likes the language of business models, but I'm going to use that as a broad term. And actually what you're seeing in front of you, it's not the detail that's important, important excuse me. It's the columns around the different types of business models. So a sole institution or a peer consortium or an industry-led approach. Um, let me show you what the literature revealed by way of business models. And then I'm going to ask Sandra to come in and share those results, um, just if only so you hear a different voice. What we found in the literature is that by far the vast majority of the studies that are published about micro-credentials are sole institutions and typically universities. And we speculatively, in a similar way to MOOCs, said that there was evidence of what we called academic colonization, where a lot of the elite Ivory League universities were seeming to be getting into micro-credentials quite quickly uh, and rapidly for reasons that were not entirely obvious. Maybe FOMO, the fear of missing out. Um, you can see that actually we found very few examples in the literature of co-construction with industry partners. Now, I know you've got that going on in Ontario, and you, I believe you'll have examples of that later today. But let me just pause for a minute. And Sandra, do you want to just tell us about how people see micro-credentials, the positioning of them in the poll? Sure. So from the top, 38% um, voted for complementary. 25% was supplementary, alternative came in at 15%, disruptive and reimagined were tied at 9%, and embedded was voted for 5%. Wow, that's that's really interesting, um, particularly the last one, because I think I'm getting ahead of myself, but the focus that we have here in my own institution and in Ireland is an embedded approach to fully embed micro-credentials into that qualification framework that I mentioned, but maybe that's the holy grail that you haven't pulled off yet in Ontario. So I'm talking about business models, and I said that sole institution approaches dominate the thinking, despite the possibilities that micro-credentials open for other approaches. Here's quite an innovative example from South, Australia, sorry, from Western Australia. Um, where uh, in Australia, of course, education is the third largest export income for the country, very similar to New Zealand. So no micro-credentials are being used to provide discounts for people coming from developing countries and bursaries as well. Um, now, this is for online delivered micro-credentials, but a little bit like buy before you try the full degree and come to us as an international student. So a very interesting driver, if you like, certainly a pathway to lifelong learning or at least to a university qualification, but a sole institution model. I mentioned MOOCs don't get much mention in the literature, but they should not be underestimated. I'm sure they're um, 
fairly commonly uh, adopted and used in um, Ontario and Canada more generally. Here's an example from the OECD data last year about the growth of micro-credentials within MOOC providers. So double digit growth on an annual basis there. So they may be, um, some of your institutions might have partnerships with um, MOOC providers. My own university does. Our very first micro-credential was offered through FutureLearn. Uh, but in terms of a business model, not to be underestimated. But then do you need a university or a post-secondary institution at all? In Dublin last year, Google, which has a, its major European offices just down the road from where I live, launched with Coursera with no university involved, a thousand free scholarships for Dublin job seekers to get them back to work um, using um, their Google career certificates in partnership, as I said, with Coursera. So here's a business model that is completely industry-led, you could argue, very disruptive, potentially. Australia is creating a marketplace for micro-credentials. So I'm coming back a little bit to my single university example, but this is where a micro-credential marketplace will not only be able to help local domestic students to reskill and upskill, but also targeting that global market. So Australia micro-credentials is very much thinking about global internationalization. In fact, you can see here, Study Australia, that a prospective student could go to, you can pull down and, and choose micro-credentials and see what's on offer and in what type of delivery mode, what region and so forth. Actually, in fairness, I think Ontario has done a pretty good job here and, and a big call out to eCampus Ontario. I, I'm sharing this slide in a number of talks. So what you've got here is evidence of a more cooperative or collaborative approach. Um, and so I think this shows that it isn't just a single institutional model that's taking place in, from what I can see from afar. Uh, in Ireland, um, we have 12 million euro investment from the government in a single approach to micro-credentials for universities. It's called the MC2 initiative, but we're only a small country with eight universities collaborating together to try to do a similar sort of one-shot stop portal for potential learners to upskill. What I want to do is demonstrate just some different business models to wrap up this, session, this section in analyzing the literature, we looked at it in two ways from looking at, if you like, a practitioner's perspective. Within your own institution, you actually have different approaches that you can adopt. And there are examples of some institutions that have gone into partnership with a for-profit subsidy or even purchased uh, a for-profit subsidy as a mechanism to offer these. Others have redesigned their schools of continuing education that already existed perhaps. So those are internal focused models. But then there are examples of external partnerships. Um, and I've touched on some of the examples perhaps already. The one that I think is really interesting is engaging in number seven, there are a consortium of universities joining together to really offer things that are different and in partnership with industry providers. The very best example of I have of that, one that I'm very familiar with and been getting my hands dirty, is called the ECI University. This is 12 European universities collaborating to try to offer um, micro-learning experiences that ultimately will be micro-credentials, where the modules are offered across, the micro-learning experiences are offered across the partners. They're not just one institution offering them under this brand of the ECIU University. But this is truly getting into quite deep and rich collaboration, using micro-credentials as a way of doing that rather than full degrees, because that really is messy work. So that's something I'm happy to talk about. But ultimately, major bodies like the OECD are arguing that if universities in particular don't change their business models, then they better watch out. Um, except what I showed you at the outset, out, outset in the literature is we're just seeing universities primarily responding with sole business models. And some would say, including this very high profile critique that all the universities are doing, and I am singling out universities in particular here, are just playing into the neoliberal learning economy. 
The driver is about selling education as a product or service for additional money. Um, this is an important argument that we can't um, not engage with. And it depends, again, why you want to see micro-credentials as really crucial to your strategic intent. If you're looking at a supermarket type approach to unbundling, yes, you can buy good olive oil and you can buy good water. Maybe they don't mix. The risk of this model where the learner is a controller of their own learning, they're taking the decisions is when I go to the supermarket, even though when I know some things on the aisle, on the stands are not good for me, I still buy them. And so it raises questions about who really puts the bundle together. Can we entirely trust that the learner is going to make good choices for their future? Um, a question, I guess, which triggers me to the, the final, or I think it might be the final poll. There may be one I give you right at the end. So let me just pause for a minute, give you a, another poll here in terms of thinking about making micro-credentials and that last argument. I didn't quite articulated as clearly as I would have liked. But what do you think? Are we in, at risk of eroding the true value of a traditional degree? There are people in my institution that would say yes. What do you think? We have a self-selected sample here, but go off and um, complete the poll and I'll bring you back in with the results via Sandra shortly. So finally, I have an eye on the time. I'm think I'm okay to make sure we have a reasonable amount of Q&A. There isn't too much to cover in this last section. What I want to do is essentially firstly say, I think we're at great risk when we're talking about micro-credentials of putting them all into one, um, if you like, oil drum. They, they vary greatly. I talked previously about old micro-credentials as distinct from newer forms of micro-credential. They're not all created equally. One of my favorite quotes is that all generalizations are dangerous, including this one. So that critique that I shared with you as a published article before really treats all micro-credentials as if they're the same. I'm not sure that such sweeping generalizations like that are particularly helpful, but I'll see what your poll result says. Nonetheless, there are three things I want to quickly cover to wrap the session up. I do think that we have to be careful about our language here. We've been, there's a long history in education of getting caught up with the rhetoric and the hope, the hype, the state of the art versus the state of the actual. Where is the real situation? Where are the practitioners? How far have they got? Then I wanna to just touch on the risk that we are just placing so much focus on the supply of micro-credentials and we really don't understand the demand side. And lastly, I want to talk about benefits, because ultimately, why would we do all of this if there weren't benefits? So very quickly, I think I only have a few slides for each of these. A study from Australia that we identified last year. Now, Australia has led the way originally with micro-credentialing, particularly Deakin University has often identified the work of Beverly Oliver in particular. So here's a survey of Australian university leaders in this field. And an assessment of where they're really at. Yes, okay, this was 2020. So maybe things have moved along quite a lot, but you can see what might arguably be a mature environment for micro-credentialing isn't immature at all, still developing um, by and large. So that's a bit of an insight into the state of the actual, despite the rhetoric. Let me talk about the demand side. So at the moment, I do feel and I fear that we are just placing so much emphasis on supply, creating marketplaces, building micro-credentials. We really don't have a good insight into the demand. A study from the OECD last year, its major report on lifelong learning showed that the real gap for upskilling in industry with employers is very small, um, medium-sized enterprises. In fact, when I say small, less than 10 staff. So what you're seeing here is the larger organizations already have their own in-house CPD. Uh, it's the smaller industry, some could argue the backbone of our economy, where the skills gap really lies. Uh, are we being targeted enough? Are we seeking partnerships with the right partners? Maybe we're seeking partnerships with those big corporates when they don't necessarily have a problem. And then the third one, the benefits side. Um, 
I started with sharing that article about a wolf in sheep's clothing. So let me make a connection back to that as I come to an end. In many respects, this is known as the sheepskin effect that universities have had in the past. It's been argued that it didn't really matter what degree you got. Um, the mere fact that you got a degree set you apart, gave you a career um, advantage, put you on the career escalator. Okay, where you got your degree from probably matters a little bit as well. And there's an argument that saying that actually the world now with its move to skills and how the Trump administration in the US signed an executive order to employ on skills, no longer on degrees, says that that sheepskin effect that universities have had historically is no longer the case. I'm not sure the data stacks up. What you're seeing here is the annual education at a glance data. Now, there's a huge time lag in this. So this is the most recent I can share with you, published last year, but it's from 2018. Basically, what it shows is the return on investment from a degree or tertiary education, post-secondary education, um, the cost is on the one side and the benefits are on the other. The benefits are both private benefits and public benefits to society. So you can see there's a clear benefit from still investing in post-secondary education as a government and the return that comes. Yes, there are some gender differences that need to be acknowledged given we celebrated um, International Women's Day earlier in the week. Note how Ireland is very high up. In some respects, what's missing from this data is Ireland doesn't really fund a lot of part-time learners, so um, they're hidden and they're also high risk. But when we turn our attention to thinking about uh, micro-credentials and the evidence of benefits, so OECD has comprehensive data, your government probably has similar level data because they have to feed it into the OECD. With micro-credentials, we have next to zip. Um, here's a survey coming from edX's MicroMasters where 6% of the participants said they got a pay rise since they completed the course. We have nothing that's really solid data. So understanding the return on investment, another way of putting that is the impact currently is a data desert. The impact for individual learners and the impact for society. So this is a huge gap in really understanding whether we are investing in the right place at the right time with the right kind of resourcing. So before I give my final comment, Sandra, do you want to just come back in with that last poll um, and then I'll wrap up and I think we've got a little bit of time for Q&A. Yep, so we received a majority of responses being no at 44%. 22% said yes, and 20% said too early to say, 8% said too late, and 5% indicated other. So what that suggests to me, thank you very much, is we do have a bit of oil and water there trying to mix. So let me finish with this one comment to try to book in the metaphor of oil and water in saying, um, using a good Irish mayonnaise, oil is not supposed to mix with water, but then someone came and invented mayonnaise and wham, instant mixing. I guess if I didn't think that we could mix the oil and water, I, I wouldn't be here talking with you today and I'm committed to rolling up my sleeves and making it work. Um, if you want to finish this last poll where we're having the Q&A, by all means do so. It's just asking you, I guess, whether you're prepared to roll up your hands as well and get ourselves dirty making micro-credentials work. I suspect it's a self-selected sample amongst us. So I'll stop um, sharing on that note and we'll perhaps take a few questions. Thank you so much, Mark, for inspiring us and sharing your insights on how institutions may imagine their toolbox, the tensions that need to be considered and worked through, but also the values that exist. And I think just like mayonnaise, you know, I was thinking about salad dressing the whole time. So maybe, you know, we can't mix the two, but we can emulsify them, you know, maybe add a few ingredients. Um, so I'm gonna start taking some questions from the chat. And as I do, I invite everyone to continue submitting questions. The first one I have here, Hello, Mark. I'm interested to know how much of the literature was focused on learner needs or preferences, 
rather than institutional or government perceptions and perspectives? Yes, well, I think um, good to have a question focused around the learner, because isn't that ultimately what we're endeavouring to do is provide opportunities and benefits for learners um, and society as well. But sadly, um, most of that literature that we reviewed really was focused on that supply side. Examples of institutions creating micro-credentials or a lot of the, the, the um, survey data of institutions' intentions um, a little bit of employers' intentions. Canada, again, stands out for a couple of quite good comprehensive surveys about prospective learners and their choices, but pretty weak overall literature and methodologically quite weak. Um, in Ireland, we did conduct a survey of learners, um, employees as well, if you like, learners slash employees incredibly difficult to generalize from this because you know each sector it will be different but what I think what the question really um, asks us to do is think about learners and their perspective and what it is that they would be interested in that would help them think of a micro-credential as a form or a pathway forward as distinct from what other forms of traditional education. Thanks, Mark. So before I go to the next question, I just wanted to read out the poll results. Um, so are you willing to make your hands to get your hands dirty making micro credentials work in Ontario and beyond? 88% said yes. 13% said depends and 0% said no, too early to say other. So that's great to hear. Um, the next question on that note of learners. Have you come across examples of micro-credentials uh, being embedded with traditional higher education programs? I see micro-credentials as an opportunity for learners to earn an evidence-based badge around specific soft skills that supplements their broader degree or diploma. So that really strikes to the core to me um, about your conception of where the micro-credential fits in the broader credential ecology. Um, and as I've said, there are some people that talk about almost the micro-credential as a Trojan horse for disrupting the traditional credential ecology and then the more supplementary, complementary approach. Examples of embedment, um, the best ones come from Europe where uh, a couple of countries like Ireland, but only a couple, already have a national qualification framework that makes that easy or easier. Um, but overall, um, I'll give you one concrete example, but overall the European-wide approach is actually one of embedment. So what we're working towards is placing micro-credentials within the European qualification framework. So they don't sit outside of our existing quality assurance processes, outside of our existing framework of qualifications. We recognize them in, in that way formally. Um, in my own institution, uh, supported, I should say, in no part by quite a sizable grant from the government. So that's a really call out for what are some of the enablers. What we're doing is building that kind of stackability into existing degrees as a pathway into a degree, but probably more so at the postgraduate level where that's perhaps the learn as you earn and people who want just in time and just enough learning, but providing short course offerings that do stack towards a formal credential um, that's recognized starting with a postgraduate certificate, a diploma and a master's degree. So um, I think, you know, there is a clear distinction in, in thinking in our definitions between non-credit bearing micro-credentials and credit bearing micro-credentials. It gets very messy here um, and I'll probably stop on that note, but perhaps the two are not mutually exclusive in that. I'll just leave you with one last comment is I think professional portfolios play a very important part here where that informal and non-formal learning, maybe you get a badge for attending this event, but your reflections that come from your attendance and participation in today's event might go into a professional portfolio that further down the track could be assessed that does lead itself into a micro-credential. So it's kind of not a if and if or, it's a, a bit messier than that. <laughs> 
Thanks, Mark. So on a similar note, um, and maybe this has to do with that perspective that you're talking about, our next question is, can you provide your perspective on the role and opportunities for RPL, recognition of prior learning, with micro-credentials? I can't talk with um, a great deal of evidence base on this. Um, we have a national project as well as a European-wide project on essentially revising current regulations around um, RPL um, to be much more inclusive of things that perhaps in the past were not recognized. I'm just not involved in either of those projects. But if we see, um, if we go back to, you know, the positioning of micro-credentials and one of those positionings was about pathways. Uh, I think your minister also talked about new pathways. For me, that's a crucial part of the, the mix here, if you like, if I want to extend that analogy of trying to mix the oil and the water. If you don't revise your RPL regulations to accommodate things that people have done that may not have been recognized in the past, maybe that's where that professional portfolio comes in because assessment is core to um, our understanding of a credit bearing micro-credential or a, a micro-credential, let's even get away from the credit bearing language that has currency. And what I mean by currency is that like the St. John's Ambulance Certificate that I talked about earlier, people value it. Thank you. And that's a great segue into our next question. You know, people valuing it. Um, based on your research and opinion, how do we reach employers to encourage the recognition of micro-credentials as valuable qualifications? And this is a two-parter. How do we encourage buy-in from employers, particularly those small businesses? Um, you almost had me until the last little bit about the small businesses, but let me start with what first came to mind. Um, one of the most interesting gaps we identified in our analysis of the literature is not so much the employers. Yes, they're important, and you do have some surveys in Canada, but those who play a role in between the employer and the employee. And what I mean by that is two groups. First, those involved in the HR sector, the major employment companies. Um, if you really want to get to the employers, you actually need to bring the employment HR companies on side. And there's very limited um, dialogue that's gone on at, at, at this point with that sector. So to my mind, that's a key stakeholder that hasn't been given sufficient um, acknowledgement. And the little bit of literature that exists shows that they're interested, but they don't understand. And hence, if they're vetting CVs and they're passing on advice to employers about prospective candidates and the like, I think uh, an education campaign is required there. The second group is we shouldn't underestimate the role that trade unions play. Now, it depends on which uh, jurisdiction or country you come from. Uh, in New Zealand, the trade unions are not as powerful as they are certainly here in Ireland, as an example. Um, I don't want to get on unsafe ground by talking about their role in, in Ontario, but in an educative sense, uh, trade unions negotiate the award um, the contract, this con the conditions of that contract. And most contracts have recognition by way of a salary or promotion increase for a macro credential, i.e. if you get a degree, a recognized qualification of some kind in that contract, that's recognized and, and a pathway. Micro credentials don't fall into those contracts currently. So we need to get into the dirty work of working alongside employers, employees and the trade unions. On the small industry side, I think that's a real challenge. Um, and I don't really have any quick answers, I'm afraid, to that, uh, other than to say that if the rhetoric is accurate, that small family or small businesses are the backbone of any economy, I say if, because I'm not an economist, um, I always wonder about these things, then that's a crucial group to get to. How you get to those small groups, I don't know. Thank you. You raised some really great points. And I see here in the chat that you know people are commenting, bringing in employment agencies. What an excellent idea. Unions. I think that that's really creative. I haven't heard of that before. So thank you. Um, you know, in raising that awareness, 
how should we go about gathering evidence on the impact of micro-credentials and who should be doing that work? Yes, this is very dear to my heart, to be quite honest. Um, probably the single biggest takeaway from our study of the literature. Because I know I heard at the outset the minister talk about um, why you're investing in micro-credentials, but governments come and go, or even ministers come and go. I've had four, I think, since I've been in Ireland. And um, somewhere someone's going to ask the question, so where's the evidence that all of this public investment and funding, let alone the private investment, made a difference? Where's the impact? And at the private level, if someone's going to pay money for this, um, you'd want to know that it truly did give you a, a career lift in some form. So I think we have to answer that question at multiple levels. There is a macro level answer, how the government is collecting data. Most institutions have to provide data to um, government agencies that can be looked at. Um, your surveys of alumni or employment destination surveys or whatever language you use of what, where people end up, we need to understand. But I think numbers and narrative have to go hand in hand. There are some powerful stories, but we have to back that up with numbers. So at the macro level, at the meso level, I guess it's the institutions have a role here. Because if you're institutionally going to invest in micro-credentials, my own institution now has a unit, a director of micro-credentials, someone's going to ask those questions. We need some evidence. And then I guess at the meso or maybe, sorry, the nan micro level, or even you could argue the nano level, we need to hear the stories. We need to hear the people on the ground and them telling us what it's done for us, for them. Um, so it operates at all those levels. And then you've got to toggle between the private return, the private, the personal benefits and the public benefits. What we know about degrees is it's not just that governments benefit by greater taxation, um, they also benefit from more educated people being more active citizens and you usually taking less uh, expense in the healthcare system and all the other less direct benefits that we know come with education. Thank you. So once we raise all of this awareness, we have all this research now saying that micro-credentials are the way, then what do you think is the most important thing institutions need to be doing to develop their capacity to support micro-credentials? So that's, again, a, a really good question, um, which I'm, I started this talk by saying I'm a bit of a fraud talking about micro-credentials because, you know, I'm in a university and I'm an academic, I'm researching them, um, what I know in practice. Well, I do know it's dirty work, um, hence that metaphor. I think it's multi-layered. I do believe firmly that you have to understand why. So understand why your senior leadership, your senior management are interested in micro-credentials. Hopefully it's not the FOMO. I would like to think it's not just about a new income stream, that it links to some of the things that were referred to at a macro level by your minister. Um, but if you don't understand the why, it's going to be a lot harder to answer the how question. And the first real tangible piece of advice, I guess, from our experience is, if you understand the why question, it's a lot easier then to go and win the hearts and the minds of your community. Um, yes, there are those that think this is just about making money stupid, and we have to build in a university environment in particular, bring our community with us, help them understand that my own university, as an example, it has an institutional mission of transforming lives and societies. So the natural link to opening up access and new pathways to learning is really clearly linked to that mission. If another way of putting it is the money is on the mission. Um, so when we couch it in that language and build our community as um, supporting this, then it's going to be much easier. But we haven't pulled that off, if I'm honest. Um, we would have some in our community that would say, all we're doing is dumbing, dumbing down traditional degrees. Why should we do this? Um, and anyway, I'm too busy. I haven't got time to break this down into smaller parts. Um, so um, it's really important to um, from an educational point of view to understand why and then educationally to help our community and by community I'm using that term deliberately it includes our students, our partners, um, our obviously staff to help them buy into why this is important. 
Thanks, Mark. So before I leave you with our big last final question, I've got one question here in the chat um, asking the large scale study is in press. When do you expect it to be published? Um, in the uh, two, two answers to that, in the micro credential observatory, which I put a link in the chat box, um, and it sounds really self fulfilling or self promoting, you will find some links to some work that we've already published some of the results in. So that's if you want a snippet of what's um, in the in the survey, oh, sorry, in the uh, literature review, which is around about 50,000 word report, then you'll find some little publications and there's publications coming out in various journal articles. The second part to the answer is that lies a lot in the hands of the European Commission who own the study because they commissioned it. Uh, and I haven't got a definitive answer because we'd love it to be out in the public domain. What I'm increasingly um, doing is leaking a little bit of a PDF version of the full report. So if anyone is really working in this area, particularly from a research perspective, send me an email and, and we can find a way of getting more of the data to you. Thank you. I know what that publication process can be like. Um, so the last question, what could possibly go wrong with micro credentials? So this is a question that actually to be uh, back to original source, Beverly Oliver put this question in a study that she completed last year that I know some of the people in this room now were involved in with um, UNESCO looking at the definitions and where micro credentials might go. My answer to that question is I'm going to go back to my supermarket metaphor because I didn't quite articulate that as well as I would have liked to. I guess my concern is that if this becomes just where it's a free market and you as the consumer can pick what you want off the shelf to make up your stack of learning, um, it's hard to argue against that in many respects. But what we know is this is stretching the metaphor. Obesity is a serious challenge in most developed countries. People are making wrong choices. Um, we know a lot about the sources of obesity. People still buy Coke. Uh, I shouldn't just single out Coke, but I'll use that as the safe example. Um, so the risk is that it becomes just a free for all. What we mean by a micro-credential loses all meaning because anything could be a micro-credential on the shelf um, and we just hand it over completely to learners. Um, I think there's a balance in this. We do need to scaffold our learners and what to help them make good choices, just like what food to purchase. Actually, one promising um, possibility here is through technology. AI might be able to help us better understand people like you in your circumstances did this and this is where it took them. So scaffolding them like that um, is one, I think, way of um, finding a balance. But that would be my scary feeling is that micro-credentials just lose all meaning and they just mean everything to everyone. Well, on behalf of uh, on behalf of everyone here at eCampus Ontario, Mark, thank you again for this fantastic address. And thank you to our audience for your participation. Um, we're going to now take a quick little break um, so everyone can go and top up their coffees and teas. And we will meet everyone back in the next session with Humber College. Thank you again, Mark and everyone. Thank you.